From the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. Thursday the 14th, 3 p.m. in London, 10 a.m. in New York, 30 minutes into the trading day in the United States. It's a nice trading day if you're in the equity market. From London, I'm Guy Johnson. Alex Steele is in New York. Welcome, everybody, to Bloomberg Markets. Alex, as I say, banks bossing this market, equities up, earnings delivering. Earnings delivering for most. Uh, Wells Fargo, I should point out, is the worst performer on the S&P. And you also have this really solid metals rally. Uh, and that's helping stocks as well. So S&P up by a full one percentage point. Tech is outperforming, but Freeport, McMahon, Copper and Gold is one of the top performers within the S&P, which goes to that metal story. So we'll skip these two for a second, go to the industrial metals index here. I mean, we're looking at near record highs for a lot of these guys. You got copper, aluminum, zinc getting an upgrade uh, from City as well. We had some uh, 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 industrial supply plants uh, shutting down for zinc, so that's hurting the supply. So there's a lot of feed through from those higher natural gas prices into the production uh, of some of these commodities. Now, you mentioned the banks, um, some of them doing well, Wells Fargo not so much, but the KBW Bank Index now flat. Now, the 530s, really interesting here. We're still at 98. Like, we just can't seem to reclaim uh, that 100 level. If we sort of live in a sort of flattener world, what does that do for the likes of the banks? And speaking of, coming up in the next half hour, we will speak to James Gorman, Morgan Stanley chairman and CEO guy. Really looking forward to that interview. There's so much to talk about, isn't there? Let's get a, a sneak preview on what we can expect in that conversation and what we're getting from the wider bank reporting season. We've only got really one major one still to come. Uh, we get Bank of America today. We've got City today. We've got Fair Wells Fargo today. Morgan Stanley. It's a busy morning for Bloomberg, Bloomberg's Wall Street reporter, Shanali Basak. Yeah. Bring it all to, like, what are the takeaways? There's so much to talk about, but what are the kind of, distill it down for us. What are the key takeaways here? Investment banking is really still on top. So you have the big investment banks, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, really delivering very strong on advisory and underwriting fees, especially in equity underwriting that has not been deterred despite this more volatile environment. But then you get to the consumer and you do see a lot of divergence. You see Bank of America really beating on net interest income. That's the big story of the day. It's Stock is higher, but you have Citigroup wavering between gains and losses today. Also, through the roof on investment banking and trading, but people are still looking through all of their consumer businesses and seeing where are their weaknesses, where are their gains, and how far do we still have to go. Really looking forward to having you back for that interview with James Gorman, Bloomberg Shalai Basic, the busiest woman right now uh, on Bloomberg Television. Uh, some other top stories that we're following for you, the eco data that's out. So you had prices paid to U.S. producers rose last month at a more moderated pace than expected, plus jobless claims fell to a new pandemic low. Let's break it all down with Bloomberg's international and economics and policy correspondent Michael McKee. Did Godot kind of take a break? <laughs> Godot kind of takes a break. You know, if you're a semi-professional broadcaster, you learn how to do segues. I'll say banks make more money if their net interest margins are higher. Are we setting off a debate about whether the Fed's going to raise interest rates? Let's take a look. I don't like this chart, and the reason I don't like the chart is because the y-axis is all screwed up by what happened in the pandemic. But I had to show that because this is shows you that we hit a pandemic low, 293,000 jobless claims last week, a post-pandemic low. We're getting back to around where we were. It does show that what we expected to happen when the extended federal benefits cut off and school started, et cetera, is finally happening. People are not filing as many claims, and that should augur well for the labor market. If people are going back into the labor market, they can get jobs. PPI was the other one. Now, this is where the debate's going to come in. Is it something the Fed can do something about or not? You take a look here at the core. This is the uh, headline and the core, and you can see that energy prices are pushing both uh, higher, but the core rate stayed flat whereas the headline rate went up because headline incorporates oil. And so we're not seeing as much movement in the lower levels, the core uh, goods uh, levels, as we saw in the headline. And so that's some good news there that suggests that maybe some of these price pressures are starting to fade as we go forward. And that's what people are going to be watching as the Fed decides when to pull things together. And this is the energy index, and you can see what happened there. This is going to be the problem going forward. Energy for everybody is getting higher, and uh, we leave it to Alex Steele to tell us when that is going to stop. I, Jay Powell's on line three for you, Alex. Yeah, I, I'm going to pick it up, but Alex will be certainly thinking about 
how to answer that question. Uh, okay, <laughs> Mike McKeith, thank you very much indeed. Um, Mike was mentioning what's happening with the energy story. Uh, shortages of natural gas in Europe and Asia, boosting demand for oil. Uh, that's deepening a supply deficit in the crude markets, according to the IEA. It's then having a ripple effect into the base metals. Within the last few minutes, copper past $10,000 a tonne again, to the highest since June. Uh, so where do we go from here? Does this continue? Eddie van der Volk joining us to give us a sense of what is happening here. I, copper's elevated. Normally, I'd take that as a sign that the global economy is, is on a really sort of strong trajectory here. Is that the right way to read it? Yeah. But, but the energy kind of read across is, is kind of confusing matters a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. You know what? There's not a story in the global economy right now that I can't draw back for you to the commodities complex. You do say banks are doing well. Well, that's because inflation's high because, you know, commodity prices are high. You ask me, you know, whether this is all a bullish story. I think we're seeing some demand destruction happening in a lot of spaces. We're seeing, uh, you know, zinc smelters scaling back production. Um, and because because natural gas prices are so high, all of it comes back to commodities at the moment. And does it keep going? I think you know we've got to worry that it does because if that if it does, even though demand isn't as strong as we would like it to be, that tells us that yep. we are sitting setting up for a, for a for a for a longer period of cost push inflation, which is not something the central bankers can easily control. Yeah, they can't do anything to activate more supply. Um, Eddie, good perspective. Thanks a lot. We'll catch you on radio in the next couple hours as well. Bloomberg's Eddie Vandervault joining us there. All right, well, let's go to Turkey because President Erdogan fired three central bank officials, driving the lira to record lows against the dollar. Joining us now is Damien Sassauer, chief emerging market credit strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence. This leaves how many that voted for a cut last meeting? <laughs> I wouldn't know the answer to that. I think only one of the three actually voted in favor of a cut, but the other two clearly were uh, uh, a little bit more hawkish. Look, what I would say is this. President Erdogan is seeking growth at all costs, even if that means diminished central bank pre policy uh, credibility is all completely lost, and it has been, by the way. So now where do we stand in Turkey? We have basically, um, you know, the, basically they're going to cut rates, and the uh, lira is going to plummet off the back of that. The central bank is going to have to dip into its FX reserves to defend the currency. And then I believe we're going to see rate hikes all over again. So this is wash, rinse, and repeat in Turkey. I mean, look, right now, locals hold half, half of their deposits in a foreign currency. And foreigners have completely exited the local market. I think less than 5% of foreign investments in, uh, in local Turkish government debt. That's down from over 30% in 2013, Alex. So that's where we are today. It's going to be interesting to see whether this ripples across into the geopolitical landscape as well. There's a whole issue surrounding jet fighters at the moment and kind of which way uh, Erdogan goes. Does he look towards Washington or does he look towards Moscow? There's all kinds of other factors that are going to be overlaying this story as well. Damien, thank you very much indeed. Damien Sasser of Bloomberg Intelligence uh, looking at what President Erdogan um, thinks about rates and inflation and how different that is to everybody else. Uh, coming up, we're going to get the market's take on the earnings season. Mira Pandit uh, is going to be joining us from JP Morgan Asset Management Global Market Strategist over there. We'll get her take on what is happening here. This is Bloomberg. From London, I'm Guy Johnson. Alex Seals in New York. This is Bloomberg Markets. Alex, equities are up. There's a bunch of factors, as you pointed out, uh, that is driving that. Bank earnings, a significant factor today. There were other results out that we're going to focus on now. Plus, you've also got this metals and energy story that's having a significant impact as well. Abigail Doolittle is going to, is going to dwell on the numbers that are outside the financial sector because we don't want to ignore those. Abigail. Guy, it is hard to believe that there's something beyond the bank earnings going on today. But we do have a number of big names that have reported, starting off with United Health Group shares really being rewarded up 4.9 percent after they put up a strong quarter, beating both top and bottom line estimates. They also raised the outlook for the full year. Cowan is saying that the results are better than feared due to COVID disruptions. Now, very interesting. Walgreens had been higher in the pre-market, now down 3.6 percent. They put up a strong quarter. Traffic really improved. The vaccine helping their sales. However, they did also announce a $5.2 billion investment in Village MD, so really pairing 
primary care physician practices with uh, their pharmacies, investors not liking it. That's often the uh, case when you do have uh, some sort of a deal, and that seems to be the case now. And then finally, Domino's Pizza, well off of its lows, at the lows down 5%. They missed same-store sales comps. It seems that there is pizza fatigue from the pandemic. Now, what makes these Oops. earnings reports pretty interesting is the fact that there's not a ton of talk here about supply chains. That is not the case this year, however. This is the number of mentions in any given year of supply chain. So going back to 2000, you can see it's less than 1000. That's basically been the case over this time period. However, this year, year to date, Alex, already we are at 3000 mentions of supply chain. Probably that trend could continue as there are, of course, supply chain disruptions from the pandemic. Yeah, it's such a good point and that's such a great chart. Abigail, thanks very much. And Guy, I'm looking through the earnings call right now for Domino's. Uh, some stores actually had to have shortened hours because of labor shortage. They had staff shortages despite the fact that they actually uh, raised wages. So they have made the supply chain issues, it seems like, overshadowed by the labor issues. I, I've got an answer to this, which is basically make your pizza at home. Make the dough, make the pizza, tastes fantastic. Yeah, then you don't have to but, worry about these I mean, supply chain shortages. I mean, I think that means you have to make the, the, the dough like on the weekend and then you whip it out and then you put it on. Otherwise, it's, it's too much work. I can barely get myself okay. together, much less my, my kid. Okay, I'm just saying it, it tastes pretty good and then any supply chain problems are going to be very, very limited, as you say. It's all pretty. It's all pretty straightforward stuff. But that would be that would be my suggestion here. Pizza rules. I, any issue on pizza? Pizza fatigue. Does Ab Abigail just talk about pizza I fatigue? I think that's a thing. That's not a thing. That's, that's not definitely a thing. not a thing. I, I think all you need to do is look at any kid under the age of 12. Um, okay, let's get some other perspective here. Uh, Mira Pan at J.P. Morgan Asset Management, global market strategist. Uh, Mira, I'm just. You may make your own pizza. I'm guessing maybe not. And I'm wondering how you're playing earnings season when the either labor supply or supply sh shortages are what everyone's talking about and what these companies are struggling to deliver. Well, so far you, you've seen earnings season off to a really strong start. Um, we're going to see really strong year over year numbers, but on a quarterly basis, things are going to get a little bit weaker than what we saw last quarter might have really been the peak. Nonetheless, we're seeing this broader recovery, but the same challenges remain uh, labor shortages inextricably linked to supply chain challenges. Um, and, and what you're probably going to see is that businesses are going to pass those costs on to consumers. If we take a look at the NFIB survey of, of smaller businesses, while about 30% are, are planning to raise wages, hopefully planning to, to bring back more workers and entice more workers to come back online, about 46% are also planning to raise prices. So it is certainly something that we're already starting to see hit margins. But at the same time, margins have been so robust that there is a bit of cushion there. Are consumers ultimately going to have a problem with that, though? The consumer at the moment looks in robust health. There's money in the bank account. We've been hearing that from the banks today. They are probably going to spend it. But does, what, what impact does higher inflation have on consumer behavior, do you think? Well, we are seeing that higher impact on consumers from inflation. We've seen inflation remain elevated. And even as we've seen rising wages, you know, if you take a look at average hourly earnings year over two years, just to subtract some of that noise from the pandemic, and you annualize that, you know, wages are growing at the fastest level in years. And yet inflation at these levels is still kind of outstripping that. So it is a challenge for the consumer. And, and with higher energy prices, that will in particular start to hit some of the, the low and middle income income households for whom utilities and gas is a larger portion of that budget. So it's not immaterial to the consumer. But as you say, overall, the consumer is in actually reasonably strong shape at this point. Yeah, the EIA said that U.S. consumer spending on energy is going to rise 43 percent compared to last winter. That is it's not just you, Guy. It, it, it's us over here, too. Do you play the energy theme, Mira? Is there a good way to do that right now? I mean, energy stocks have had a pretty solid run at this time. They have, but I think that energy stocks is, is still something that we view as somewhat more tactical. Yes, the rising prices are going to help profits, and in and of itself, we are in a, a recovery from an earnings perspective, that, that cyclical area of the market that's really bouncing back from last year. But I don't think that those dynamics are going to last in the long run, because we still are amidst this energy transition, this increase in renewables. Um, it will occur in fits and starts, and we're going to see some volatility across a lot of different types of energy commodities. But 
We've seen this swing in supply and demand in which last year we had a glut of supply and, and not a lot of demand. Now we're seeing the pendulum swing the other way where we've seen producers been very disciplined about their production and supply, where we've seen you know hurricane related disruptions, wind related disruptions over in, in, in Europe. Um, but you know these dynamics do tend to oscillate and in particular in light of the pandemic. So we do expect them to, to smooth out over time, bringing uh, energy prices more in line, but it will take a little bit of time and we could have some, some uh, sticker shock on some bills this winter. If we get though to a point where, as you say, this is starting to fade, we get back to say two to 3% inflation, which I would imagine the Fed will be fairly comfortable with. What does that mean in terms of the trajectory for rates and by extension other assets? If the Fed is okay with two to three, we get through taper, what does that tell us about the rate trajectory? Because if the Fed is going to kind of sit back and, and let things develop, presumably that's pretty solid news for, for risk assets. Well, what you'd likely see is that they'll keep with the tapering timeline, initiate that tapering process later this year, and by the middle of next year, that's going to help put some upward pressure on yields and really help that yield curve steepen, particularly as the, the shorter term rates remain anchored at zero. And in that environment, it would continue to be pretty supportive for some of the more value oriented or cyclical stocks. I mean, take financials, for example, we, we've seen all the bank earnings this morning. Um, it greatly aided by a lot of the, the loan loss reserve releases and, and you know great investment banking fees. But at the same time, um, still some challenges from a very flat yield curve this summer. If we start to see that um, start to, to, to really steepen up into the next year, that's going to be supportive for, for areas like that within the market. Uh, let's go to tech for a, for a second. Some well-named investors are like, look, buy tech, but make sure you have an exit strategy, Barbara Nutt, for example. Um, what do you do with technology? I think even when we start to see rates rise, it'll be a long time before it's truly punitive. And rates are just one factor that, that might weigh on growth stocks. Whereas, look, if we think about some of these business models, the incredibly strong profitability during a pandemic year, during a recovery year, they, they really are becoming quite all weather and really important quality parts of portfolios. Yes, we wanna be mindful of some of the areas that have already run a long way in terms of valuations, but I do think that a lot of these tech stocks are long term holdings regardless of, of the rate environment just given the kind of broader dynamics around that sector. Mira it's always a pleasure really insightful thank you very much indeed. Mira Pandit JP Morgan Asset Management Global Market Strategist thank you very much indeed. What are we going to talk about next? The world's biggest chip maker sees a bullish end to 2021. TSMC more on Taiwan semiconductors results next. This is Bloomberg. time for the Bloomberg Business Flash, a look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. I'm John Hyland. Walgreens Boots Alliance posted fiscal fourth quarter earnings that beat estimates. The pandemic and the U.S. vaccination program continue to have a powerful effect on the huge drugstore chain. Comparable sales at Walgreens U.S. stores were up more than 8 percent. And mixed results for Domino's in the third quarter. The pizza chain reported revenue that missed estimates. Sales at domestic stores fell almost 2 percent, while international sales rose almost 9 percent. Meanwhile, Domino's profit was better than expected. And in Manhattan, apartment rents have risen for the first time since the early days of the pandemic. The median rent increased almost 6% last month from a year earlier to $3,200.16. That's according to appraiser Miller Samuel and broker Douglas Elliman. Apartment hunters are grabbing units as employers call workers back to their Manhattan offices. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Guy? John, thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's talk about some of the other earnings we've been talking about, though I do still love the pizza story. TSMC, the world's largest chip foundry, Alex, seeing profits topping estimates, unsurprisingly, considering that we've been talking about chip shortages for a very, very, very long time, it seems. But apparently there is more still to come for TSMC. Bloomberg Stocks editor Dave Wilson looking into the numbers. Yeah, there absolutely is more to come, Guy. I mean, looking out to next year, I mean, they see issues in terms of being able to keep up with demand. But let's focus on the third quarter. I mean, some of the numbers were out earlier, uh, revenue uh, specifically. Nonetheless, I mean, net income, uh, sales, cash flow, 
all well above uh, a year ago, and uh, in terms of the top and bottom lines, beating analyst average estimates in the Bloomberg survey. So, and looking ahead, you know, one of the key things for, for TSMC is profitability. Now, they have this long-term target uh, for gross margin of 50%. Uh, in the third quarter, they came in just above 51 percent, uh, a bit of a rebound from a, a low in the second quarter. Uh, they're projecting out uh, that their gross margin may be as high as 53 percent this quarter. So profitability going in the right direction. Not a surprise, I mean, given what's happening in the chip industry and, and the potential for TSMC to raise prices next year, as uh, some of its peers have already done multiple times. Uh, also, you have TSMC sort of shifting its business, seeing some weakness ahead uh, in terms of demand for chips used in mobile phones and computers. Uh, where, you know, in the case of smartphones, they have a lot of business, so they're shifting toward automakers. We know that's an issue. Uh, if you look at their biggest customers, you see where all that comes together. Apple, a quarter of their revenue, and a lot of the rest going to other chip makers, because TSMC is basically a foundry, as it's described. Uh, they're making chips for other companies, as opposed to uh, coming up with their own designs, in a lot of cases, at least. So we are seeing a ripple effect in, in the market. For example, Dave, you have European tech stocks at a two-week high. You have the whole uh, semi uh, space kind of getting boosted here. What's the read-through for the U.S. chip makers? Yeah, I mean, absolutely more of the same as far as that goes, Alex. What you're seeing in Europe is what you're seeing in the U.S. as well. Uh, you know, NVIDIA, one of their biggest customers, uh, higher. Uh, you've got uh, Intel and uh, AMD Advanced Micro Devices up as well. Certainly gains across other chip makers. NXP Semiconductor, one example there. And the chip equipment makers, Applied Materials, KLA, Ram LAM Research, also higher. I mean, bear in mind, TSMC has committed itself to spending $100 billion over the next three years on, you know, capital projects, including putting up a new plant in Japan. So what's good for the chip makers is good for the equipment companies, too. Fair enough. Dave, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Bloomberg's uh, Dave Wilson joining us there. And, and, and no doubt, uh, Guy, as, as we wind up having these solid results, analysts getting more positive on the stock, um, I guess the question becomes, how long does all this take? When does a supply chain write itself? I mean, semis typically are very cyclical industries because of this very issue. You get a price incentive to build more stuff, build more foundries, build more yep. factories, and therefore you get more supply. Well, I guess there's a number of things to say here, one of which is, I, the Taiwan focus obviously is concerning when it comes to the supply chain story because if you take a look at the geopolitical overlay, yeah. uh, again, you look at what's happening between China and China and Taiwan. Yep. Uh, that obviously is a cause for concern. You take a look at what's happening with ASML mm -hmm. as well. I, these are the these are the lithography companies that make the stuff that sell to TSMC, uh, and they're, like, they're, they're saying that they're supply constrained at the moment, which means that that process is going to unfold quite slowly. And also, we're just like, you want to build chip factories in, in different places. Yeah. That's just, that, it's just not as efficient. Diversification. So then that might cost more. It's, it's, it's going to take a while, I think. Yeah. All yeah. right, coming up, uh, Morgan Stanley up by just three-tenths of 1%. Crushing estimates, though. We're going to speak to the CEO, James Gorman. This is Bloomberg. Approaching half past the hour, live from London, I'm Guy Johnson, Alex Steele in New York. This is Bloomberg Markets. Alex, normally we don't stop the show to talk about the EIA natural gas storage data. But I think given current circumstances, this is worthwhile, uh, a worthwhile exercise. Last week, 118. This week, forecast at 94.46, i.e. quite a significant shift. I think it's measured in BCFs, which I think is billion cubic feet. Uh, but we've actually come in at 81, which is a much bigger draw. I, that's, a, that's a really big drop. Uh, yeah, so it rose just 81 billion cubic feet uh, last week. So that kind of fits into the narrative that uh, we're using a lot more gas. Uh, and will we have enough gas through the winter? I mean, some utilities are starting to run coal right now in the U.S. Um, LNG exports are still getting pushed out at max capacity. We haven't curbed those exports yet, but this feeds into the whole do we have enough storage situation uh, with uh, storage change about up by about 81 uh, billion cubic feet as of last week. So now you're looking at something like 3.3 um, a trillion cubic feet is what we have kind of in total. Um, yep. It remains to be seen, though, what anyone can really do about that. 
the natural gas producers are like, yeah, we're going to produce, we're going to totally produce. It's just a matter of how much CapEx is actually being spent to increase production, not just actually maintain it. And, and you guys have loads of the stuff compared with us. Oh, yeah. I, that's, that's the real difference at the moment. Europe, uh, you, you are unable to export all of the gas that you produce. We are unable to fill our storage because we can't import enough of it. Uh, and that's where the problem lies. And this is what is fueling so much of the inflation narrative but here in Europe. The energy crisis is massive. But I think another big part of that is some of the infrastructure, like certain pipelines have been delayed, certain pipelines yep. haven't scrapped. And so that's leading to, like, you may have a lot of gas here, but where is it going to get to, uh, which leads to other issues. And that's why it feels like part of this inflationary story when it comes to commodities could be more uh, structural than cyclical because those are not easy fixes. And like I mentioned, uh, some utilities uh, have already started uh, running uh, uh, coal here in the U.S., much more so than what we've seen uh, elsewhere. So all of this kind of feeding into the narrative when earnings report. Uh, let's get more now. Morgan Stanley crushed analyst estimates for the third quarter. We welcome now our TV audience and radio listeners to James Gorman. Morgan Stanley chairman and CEO joins us now. Also with us, Bloomberg's Shanali Basic. Uh, James, thanks so much for joining us. I'll hand it over to for Shanali for a few questions. Yeah, absolutely. James, thank you thanks, so much for, for joining us. You know, you have said just this morning you beat expectations and almost all of your major business lines. You've said you're gaining market share. Where can we expect you to expand the most in the next six to 12 months? Well, there's, st there's still a, a heck of a, a way to go, uh, Shanali. Firstly, thanks for having us on. But we've got, you know, we've got a lot of things in motion. We've just started really the whole workplace strategy. And we have several million clients that we brought to the firm through Solium and through E-Trade that's just kicking off. I mean, the asset flows coming into the wealth and asset management business, I think we're about 400 billion year to date in new money that's come in. And then we're continuing to see share gain and extremely good performance across the whole investment banking sales and trading platform. I don't expect the investment banking pipeline to slow down at this point. Um, it remains very robust. And then as you know, eventually the Fed starts tapering, uh, move to rate increases, you're gonna see more volatility in the fixed income space. Uh, which we'll participate in. So there's there's a lot of stuff going on right now. Well, let's speak to those challenges for a second, James. You know, you had said during our earnings call a little bit earlier to watch out for volatility. Many of your peers have been very worried about interest rates. What are you most worried about as we start to close up this year still? Well, I'm not, you know, I think I just said you've got to be mindful. I mean, we're, we're seeing sharper movements in the market by the day. Uh, some of the sort of earlier bubbles around SPACs have clearly gone off the boil a little bit. Uh, there's more geopolitical tension between the US, China, talk of Taiwan, et cetera. So I think you've just got to be, you know, our job is to be mindful and to, on the one hand, have your foot on the accelerator, but the other, constantly be looking for where the big potholes are. And that's basically what I mean by being cautious. But honestly, in the next several months, I think the market has digested that the Fed will have to move, not just on tapering, but on rate increases. And by the way, we're 10 rate increases away from what would be considered normal. We could do 10 quarter point rate increases. So bring it up a little bit over the next year is not that's not a crisis and not unexpected. So you said uh, not not a crisis. So do you think that a lot of people who are worried about the next correction in the market are those fears misplaced? No, the people are always worried. I mean, markets go up and go down. One wise person once said, and you know, when you've got basically free money record fiscal stimulus, global synchronized growth, of course the market's going to do well. I mean, whenever are they not going to do well if this, if this environment is, doesn't make it happen? None will. But that doesn't mean that it's going to go in a straight line forever. I've been doing this a long time. You have corrections. You have moments of excess. You have uh, re reassessments. The investor's psyche changes. We'll go through one of those periods, but I'm not expecting some major crisis. And, you know, nothing like the shocks that we've been through in the last 30 years that were really material. Yeah, James, it's Alex. Um, we're trying to understand sort of as we come out of COVID, what a normal environment looks like. As you look at your business. I hope you've figured that out for us. Yeah, no, I have not. That's <laughs> why I'm asking you. Uh, what kind of market share, what kind of business do you become when we quote unquote normalize? You know, it's, it's very interesting. In the last 15 years, the very large global U.S. investment banks have gained share. And the scale economics you need and the technology you need to drive these global businesses is so expensive and so intense. It's, it's a real moat around them. So I think the scale economics have accrued to those who were prepared to invest in their businesses and got bigger. Same with wealth management. I mean, wealth and asset management 
Alex, we're, we're managing, you know, nearly six and a half trillion dollars. Somebody can go out and hire a financial advisor here or there or pick up a good relationship, whatever. But you, six and a half trillion compounding is a massive number. So I see our future as this combination of the balance of the speed of the investment bank with the balance that wealth and asset management give us, but both really scale businesses, both, you know, number one or two or three in each of their categories around the world, wealth and asset management combined and institutional combined. James, uh, good morning. It's Guy in London. All I hear about over here is that the portfolio managers are either looking to be paid more or looking to hire people at higher wages. I I'm assuming that you're seeing the same thing over there. What is that going to do ultimately to cost going forward, though? You know, they should be paid. They should be paid well if they've done well. And, you know, ours have done phenomenally. So I'm not surprised you're hearing it. It's just a consequence. You've got revenues up. Obviously, they're ringing the bell. They're bringing the client business in. They're serving their clients exceptionally. Portfolios performing well. I would expect the portfolio managers to do well. On rising costs for the industry, I mean, we're we're in a talent-driven organization, and you know, we've, we're going to do revenues this year. We're a pro forma around 60 billion. So we have enormous capacity around the compensation pools to absorb rising costs for the for the young kids coming in and so on. That's why we made some adjustments, Guy. I don't see that. That's not a material threat for an organization like ours. Yeah, and how long does it continue for? You had mentioned that this is not actually just an investment banking. This is also in your wealth business, attracting a lot of people. Do you see this wage pressure on the industry lasting for a while? And what is that going to do in terms of the ability to control expenses at the end of the day? Yeah, Shanali, I, I really don't think it's going to be that important to what we do. I mean, the, this industry understands when markets are good, they're getting paid better. When they're not, they're not. You know, if you don't perform, uh, it goes down. So I think that there, there are some natural sort of hedges within these kinds of businesses that the traditional companies don't have. So honestly, you know, my focus is on making sure we pay our people uh, well for great jobs done and they'll get paid great for doing that. That's that's our focus. But it's it's not a it's not an anxiety around wage inflation for this kind of company. Mm -hmm. Very different industries, obviously. Uh, affected dramatically by what I see as real wage inflation around the world. Yeah, in that way, you're, you're much more relatively insulated. But let's just go to jobs uh, for a second, James. Um, last year, yeah. you promised not to cut jobs. Um, is that view changing now as things are, quote unquote, normalizing? Well, we did, you know, I was, that was something we decided, I think it was back in February, Alex, and, and we thought there was one thing we could take anxiety off our employees' shoulders was guarantee their job for the year. I mean, they had enough dealing with COVID and all the health issues and the economic issues going on around them and their families, we thought that was the, the right thing to do as part of our core values of do the right thing. You know, we're in a different place this year. We guaranteed everybody their job, but we're not looking to cut jobs. I mean, we're actually trying to hire people. So uh, we get over 100,000 resumes a year, as you would imagine. Uh, but, you know, we've had some attrition, but not great. And we had very little last year. So, you know, we're, we've certainly got a lot of open positions here. And we're not, you know, there's no major job cutting exercise that I see in the future at all. James, you mentioned inflation just a moment ago when you talked about wages. Inflation is going up broadly in a number of areas at the moment. Listening to what you said, both in this conversation and on the call a little bit earlier on, you seem pretty confident uh, about the trajectory we're on. You see clearly some bumps in the road. But can I, I, you don't see inflation getting out of control. You see this as being something that we can manage our way through. Well, you know, I mean, that, that, that's my assumption is that the Fed will, will manage through. I mean, they'll have to bring rates up. My uh, prediction, Guy, has been for a long time, I've been much more hawkish. Uh, I would have brought rates up, you know, certainly by the first quarter of next year, I'd start moving. They have a lot of capacity to move, and I think you've got to prick this, prick this bubble a little bit. Money's a bit too free and available right now. So, yeah, we're seeing, you know, and I'm not a buyer of this story that it's all transitory, the inflation story. It's not transitory. I mean, wage inflation is real, and the supply chain interruptions, and you were talking about some of the natural gas and other things, have, have clearly been real. Some of that is temporary, but not all of it. So I think we're in a period where inflation is going to tick up. I think it's going to force the Fed's hand to move a little more aggressively than they're probably predicting now. And you saw that in the dot points that came out at the last FOMC meeting. I think, if I'm right, there were five dots for a uh, rate increase in 2022. That moved to nine dots at the next meeting. So we're seeing it through the Fed's own numbers.
I really appreciate the really clear language about the inflation outlook there, James. You know, you also said today that Asia was a really big part of your gain in equities this quarter around. Obviously, when it comes to China, we've seen a lot of volatility built around those crackdowns. How do you view the region and its ability to help you push forward uh, in the next few months or years? Well, we have a huge business in Asia, but, you know, all the way from where I grew up in Australia through to uh, Japan with our partnership with MEFG and obviously China, Greater China, Hong Kong, and through Southeast Asia, Indonesia, and Singapore. So it's actually quite a diversified business. Um, we're not oversized in China. I mean, relative to the opportunity, we do very well. We're number one or two in a lot of the markets. We have an A-share license through a company called Washing Securities, but we're not oversized. We've got, you know, all of our wealth business, 95% of that is U.S.-based. So we have a huge buffer in that we're very U.S.-centric with our wealth business, asset management more diversified, and the institutional trading businesses are really, you know, they're diversified geographically. So China is obviously critical to us, uh, but the current tensions and whatever happens as a result of that is not going to change the fundamental trajectory of Morgan Stanley. James, we really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for so much of it. Morgan Stanley, Chairman and CEO, James Gorman. And of course, our thanks to Bloomberg's Shanali Basak. Okay, let's get some reaction. Let's talk about what is happening with these numbers that are coming out of the banks. Let's think about what we've just heard from James Gorman, James Trainer, CEO of investment research firm New Constructs, joining us now. What did you make, David, of what we just heard? I think the market's really clearly going to punish those whose businesses are relying on the very cyclical investment banking environment and not showing any real success in the loan growth business. So if you're beating the number because of releasing reserves, the market's not going to count that. And they, they want to see these banks mirror the success that Morgan Stanley's had in a lot of ways with respect to their growth into the uh, retail and asset management businesses, which are a bit less cyclical than your corporate investment banking and trading. Do you think the numbers that we've seen from Morgan Stanley, like bringing in $1 billion in advisory fees, equity underwriting above a $1 billion, is this the top or do you think that there's more room to, to, to boost here when it comes to Morgan Stanley? That's a great question. I think we're close to the top if it's not the top. Look, it's very difficult to, to ever call the top on, on anything, but I think we're close to the top. I also think the asset management businesses are close to a top in general in that, look, we've seen growth and profit growth uh, purely by acquisition and scale. And we wrote a position piece last year saying distribution is not enough. These firms are very commoditized, right? You know, Goldman Sachs and, and Morgan Stanley, they've got great brands, but at the end of the day, the asset management business is very commoditized. Talent's going to get a lot more expensive because there are very few people, as we know, who consistently beat the market. So these firms are going to have to really continue to innovate in a way that I don't think we're hearing them talk about, right? We talk about really strong franchises, global franchises, yeah. huge businesses and scale. I don't think that's enough anymore. David, how do they do that? We have clearly seen acquisitions taking place. You, you listen to Jamie Dimon and you hear him talk about fintech uh, and the fact that, that it is playing uh, in a different ballpark to the one that he's playing in because of the lighter regulation. Is this industry just going to continue to eat up the, the kind of the fintech as it comes through? How do they compete with it if they can't do that? What's the strategy? Because there is a whole world developing in financial services at the moment that, that operates on a different regulatory framework. Yeah, no, Guy, this is going to be fascinating, right? Because you, you've got, you know, J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, just to name a couple, you know, they've done the right thing. They have huge numbers of customer relationships. And that's one thing that for all of their technological superiority, the D5 protocols do not have. Right. And you can't really make any money or have to do any business if you don't own the customer relationship. And so that's a very large strategic competitive advantage for the big banks. Now, what they don't have is the technological ability to keep up with the DeFi protocols and the, and, and the blockchain technology if they don't buy their way in. Uh, fortunately, they also have a lot of cash to do that as well. So what I think you're going to see is sort of a, a gradual transformation of these traditional banks into more tech savvy firms via acquisition uh, and, and, and it's just sort of a gradual trans, 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 transformation as these technologies become um, more David, widely adopted. 
David, we're going to leave it there. We really appreciate your instant analysis. Thank you so much, David Trainer, New Constructs uh, CEO. Uh, really appreciate that as well. Um, okay, coming up. French Finance Minister Bruno Le Maire just wrapping up a briefing with reporters in Washington. He'll be joining us next. This is Bloomberg. So the French Finance Minister Bruno Le Maire just finishing a briefing with reporters in Washington. He's in the U.S., of course, for the IMF World Bank meetings that are taking place in D.C. He's with Bloomberg's Amory Hordern, dodging acorns. Amory, over to you. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. We are dodging acorns. The sky is almost literally falling here in Washington. Thank you, Guy. And I'm now joined by the finance minister, Bruno Le Maire. Thank you so much for joining Bloomberg. I want to just start about the tone of your trip here in Washington, D.C. It comes after the dispute between Paris and Washington. And you described the U.S. as misbehaving. Do you still feel like the United States is misbehaving? I think that the tone during uh, all the meetings uh, was uh, positive and constructive. Uh, we had very interesting and constructive talks with uh, Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, uh, with the President of the Fed, uh, Jay Powell, with uh, all my uh, American friends. Uh, I will have uh, some uh, meetings within the, the White House uh, in a few minutes. So I think that we are on the right way to uh, build back and to uh, have a constructive relationship on all the financial and economic topics. Another big question mark is, of course, how to approach China. You say the United States wants to be a little bit more combative while Europe wants to engage. Does this just mean that there's going to be an inevitable division on the transatlantic relationship? Because China is a cornerstone of the Biden, not just foreign policy, but domestic policy. First of all, I would like to insist on the fact that uh, we share common values with the United States. Uh, we believe in democracies. We believe in the rule of law. We believe uh, in the human rights, and this is at the core of the relationship between the United States and Europe. Then there is this big question for the next decades, how to deal with China. This is clearly the key question for all of us. The United States wants to oppose China. Europe wants to engage China. So there is a difference of view. We need to discuss about that because this is clearly a strategic question. So let's discuss about the best way of talking with China, working with China. We don't think that opposing China is the right way of behaving, but let's discuss about that key question. Another point of divide, of course, is taxation. But now we have the OECD plan. Does this definitely mean then we will not see the digital levies in Europe? But the digital levy to, to me is not the right solution because it would mean new uh, taxations on uh, private companies. Uh, but uh, we uh, succeeded in finding a compromise on this uh, strategic question, which is a new international taxation system for the 21st century. This is a tax revolution. This is the first time that we succeeded in finding a solution on taxation issues. There is no way back. This means uh, more fairness, more efficiency in the way we will tax the biggest companies in the world, the way we will tax profits made by uh, companies without any physical presence in the nations. So that's clearly a major achievement. Mm -hmm. France played a key role and the United States uh, under President uh, Biden's uh, leadership gave the final push. So that's, I think, a very clear evidence that we are working well together on those key questions. But will the EU drop the digital levy now? Does that set we the will. path forward? We will drop our national digital taxation as soon as the international taxation system will enter into force and will be implemented. As soon as there will be this international digital taxation being implemented, we will withdraw mm -hmm. our national taxations. I, I took a very clear commitment to uh, the U.S. administration, to uh, Janet Yellen, and we will, of course, stick to our political commitments. What about guarantees from the U.S. on their tariffs on France and Europe? Did you get any guarantees that those will be dropped? For the time being, no, but we want, of course, these uh, sanctions and these tariffs to be dropped. If uh, we uh, commit to withdraw our national taxation, there must be a commitment from the U.S. administration to uh, withdraw their tariffs on France and on all European countries. That's the best way of building a constructive relationship and a friendly relationship 
between the two continents. One thing that's going on in France and Europe is the energy prices. You've been in politics and economics for decades. You know the yellow vests well. What is France going to do to try to ease some of these rising energy costs? You, you need to take a um, short-term solution and you need to address the issue right now. That's exactly what we are doing with the Prime Minister and with uh, the French uh, President. Uh, we have decided to introduce uh, very uh, clear and strong decisions to uh, protect the consumers against uh, this uh, increase of the energy prices that are clearly unbearable for are the price people. Are you worried about inflation now? Is that uh, a bigger we risk? Have, we, we have a level of inflation uh, which is consistent with uh, the strength of the economic recovery, but the level of inflation is directly linked with the energy prices, and that's why we want to protect the consumers from this increase in the energy prices. And you also need a long-term solution. And the long-term solution for us is a total overhaul of the European energy market. We don't want the electricity price to be dependent on the gas price. All right, Bruno Le Maire, thank you so much thank for you. your time today. Alex Guy, the French finance minister, here at the beautiful French ambassador's residence, Bruno Le Maire. I think one of the key takeaways of these conversations between the United States and Europe, especially France, as they mute music starts to change following the subspat, is that the big question going forward is how to deal and engage or combat China. Yep, 100%. Uh, thanks so much, Anne-Marie. It was a great interview. French Finance Minister Bruno Le Maire uh, speaking with Anne-Marie Hordern uh, in Washington. So it feels like the longer-term strategic shift is going to be how to deal with China guy. It does, though, feel, as you heard at the end, that in terms of the energy crisis, it needs to be short-term solutions right now. So that would imply, say, more subsidies, et cetera, but then longer-term solutions. So still standing behind that renewable green energy push. Yeah, one cannot divert Europe from the other, I think, is, is the challenge in the more medium term. But in the short term, Europe faces a number of different challenges. France still relies and imports a lot of Russian gas. Germany imports even more. Yeah, um, more. Where does that leave Europe? Where does that leave European security? France obviously has made a big bet on nuclear. Germany's walked away from that. I, there, there's, a, there, there's a patchwork across Europe in terms of energy needs and demands. And, and resolving that on a coordinated basis, I think, is going to be, be really tricky, um, particularly if you are then putting a green overlay on top of all of that. You then put China into the mix as well. Uh, Europe relies on Russia for energy and China for exports. Yeah. That's a pretty tough place to be. Yeah, and I, and I just wonder sort of how, who, who sort of takes the reins here? Like, clearly... Macron's trying yep. to do that to some extent, but there are elections that are going to be coming up that will prove difficult. Germany's still working on their government, of Merkel stepping back, so Olaf Scholz, sure, uh, potentially. But it's like, who's going to be that person that's really going to unite and lead? Um, can Macron and Scholz do that uh, together? What, what if Macron doesn't win? I mean, yep. there are just lots of political overlays as well that I think is going to make things a little bit more complicated to get something cohesive done. There's a, there's a name you're missing off that list, which, of course, is Mario Draghi coming out of Italy. Yeah, true. But he's not elected, so that, does that change that narrative? And he also feels very focused uh, yeah. on, on what he's doing in Italy right now, though he has taken Italy back firmly in terms of its relationship uh, with China to a more European base, looking at China in a more cautious way. Uh, anyway, we're going to talk about all of this. We're going to continue to focus on what is happening with the inflation narrative, the energy story. Uh, we'll be joined in the European close by Kieran Ganesh. Uh, he is UBS Wealth Management. Uh, we'll find out what he thinks about this story next. This is Bloomberg.